My name is Kate Osgood, and I have been a hiker and lover of nature my whole life. And I have been increasingly concerned about the preservation of wilderness, especially living in Los Angeles. So my capstone project is about the, what a city can do to preserve its adjacent wilderness. Wilderness is defined as areas that are not manipulated by humans or populated by humans. A wilderness gives us our natural resources, generates biodiversity, creates habitat. What? And, um, sorry. and it gives us the beauty of solitude. The, loss of the traditional rural buffer zone between cities and wilderness has caused a lot of problems. Uh, one is the overuse, recreation overuse, uh, causing erosion and habitat loss, the increase in intensity of wildfires, the loss, lack of stewardship in citizens, and the urban pollution and runoff, as well as habitat fragmentation and loss of biodiversity. Some architectural, landscape architectural solutions include education, which I think is the most important, um, nature centers, botanical gardens, children's gardens, and adventure or nature-based playgrounds are places that foster stewardship in our children. And as adults, they will be more likely to vote for conservation projects. And additional solutions are restoration of our natural systems, reclamation of storm water, as well as uh, protection of our existing uh, ecosystems. Further solutions are the protection of historical gardens and landscapes, a hierarchical trail system which gives people a nature-based experience without impacting wilderness, and the formation of gateways that bring you from one place to another. The formation of a gateway park where the park itself becomes the buffer zone and within the park will give nature-based experiences and passive and active learning elements, trails and pathways, and program elements that protect the park and the wilderness, as well as a protective buffer. The formation of a gateway park system throughout like a city like Los Angeles would allow the citizens to enjoy and learn about different ecosystems like the wetlands of Bologna Creek or the Los Angeles River or the National Forest. And each park would then be an educational area as well as a protective of its ecosystem. So as a model for a gateway park, I chose Ferndale Park. Ferndale Park is run by the city parks department. It is part of Griffith Park, which is the largest wildland park in the country. And it is also at the eastern edge of the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, Ferndale Park has its south entrance in Los Feliz neighborhood and the north entrance in Griffith Park. It also has a parking lot, uh, Trails Cafe, which is a private cafe, a detention pond, Ferndale Gardens, um, Griffith Park trailheads, and a lots of open space, a parkway, and the urban entrance with the California bear statue. Within Ferndale Park exists Ferndale Gardens, and Ferndale Gardens is a special garden that was constructed in the 1930s around a natural spring and it is currently under review for cultural landscape status. The edge conditions are very important in a buffer park. The storm water comes down Western, Western Canyon Road and 
goes into the storm drain and carries with it urban pollution. The southern section that is along the residential neighborhood uh, has visual access and sound access to residents' backyard, and the northern section is where the park meets the wildlands of Griffith Park. The circulation pattern is most of it is open space. The pathways have long disappeared and it causes erosion and loss of understory. There's uh, walking paths from the south which are also in disrepair. There's the Ferndale Ferndell Drive to Western Canyon Road, which goes up along and actually goes up to the uh, Griffith Observatory. And then there are the trailheads to interior of Griffith Park, which are in very good shape. And there's two construction, constructed waterways that take water runoff from Griffith Park. And then there is a natural stream that runs through Ferndell Gardens into uh, Los Feliz Boulevard. The transition from the residential neighborhood to the wildlands of Griffith Park is actually quite apparent as you walk from south to north through the park where it's very urban at the bottom and then very natural and up to the wilderness into the, at the top. So here is my concept diagram placed upon the park where it transverses both the residential area and the uh, wildlands. So the entrance then would maintain its urban character and have site information, park information. The lower pathway would be designed to deal with the edge effect of the residential neighborhood. The Griffith Park trailheads would be where gateways are and the upper area would also have a gate, an entry gateway to collect people from the parking lot. And then the waterways would deal with the stormwater uh, runoff situation. And then Ferndale Gardens be addressed in terms of protection. And the Trails Cafe, the picnic area could be there. And the central open space is where the park, the uh, special nature center and gardens would be. The first thing you notice when you go to this park are the incredible trees, and the very old and beautiful trees. Most of them are native, and there are some specimen trees. Using trees as a design metaphor gives both a color palette derived from the bark and leaves, as well as structural uh, ideas. And there are faux bois handrails throughout the whole place, which were built in the 30s, and that gives a historical precedent. And these are some design inspiration ideas for using trees to design spaces and construct gateways. So the tree itself, the systems of the tree, the parts of the tree define how it works and how it runs. And creates the tree as a whole. By placing the tree on the site, the roots are the main entrance where urban goes into the park, the bark protective elements, the burl, which is a very concentrated area, is the nature center. The branches to the leaves are how the park goes into the wilderness. Of course, the xylem and phloem are circulation and the knots are where the center of activity is located. So here is the site plan and the focusing on the roots. And this is the entry plaza which retains its urban feel, but because it's at the roots, I've used it as a place to learn about the geology of the site. And in place of the, like a traditional center obelisk, it's a monolithic rock. And upon that would be uh, site information like maps and exhibits. The protective systems of the bark. And the first one is the stormwater collection. By the upper area, it has the ravines that run along the road. And by removing the sidewalk, there's also a fence there. By removing the sidewalk, the water can sheet off into the existing 
ravines. And then the lower one, which is a much shallower area, with having curb cuts and a swale that runs along it would do the same thing. And then the Southern Air Parkway, where it runs along the residential edge, would have plants, a vegetated edge, uh, with toyone and ceanothus, you know, native shrubbery. And the, par the pathway would move to the center of the area and that would give a buffer zone between the park and the residential neighborhood. Certainly, there's a lot of um, unauthorized trails which cause habitat loss and plant destruction and erosion. So having two things, a vegetate, more vegetated edge planting, which I think California roses and currants to really detract people, but still allows animals access and then an elevated walkway would reduce the impact on the ecosystem, but also give visitors a completely different way of experiencing that area and the ecosystem there. The Burl, which is where the Nature Center is, and here's the Nature Center. And it, I, I think it would be self self-policing and you done by volunteers and not as necessarily a, a ranger-led thing. I have the, the nature center bermed into the, the um, terrain and it's on the existing site of the bathrooms or the existing bathrooms and the back wall could be another educational opportunity by looking at the soil strata. And then the gateways, there's four trailheads, but they're both, there's two and two. And then the gateways, I was really influenced by Roxy Payne, which is the center image of these really incredibly large uh, branches that would go over the uh, pathway and people would pass under it. I, I do think also this is a good place for a public art opportunity. And that could be an interesting dialogue. And then at the north section, too, across from the parking lot, the, as it goes from the park into the branches and leaves, it's also a more natural area. So it would have natural plantings. The, all the plantings are native, but this area would be more of a natural place. And you can see there's maps and information located there. Because right now, there's no maps or information anywhere just to throw that out there. Uh, the circulation would connect all the different program elements together. And also, my idea was to concentrate the activity in the center and to have pa the pathways be buffered by the center by more plantings to give people more solitude when they're still within the park and not have to go to Griffith Park for that. And then the center area is the knot or the hole. And it's where the experiential gardens, and the nature center, I moved uh, the picnic tables across from the Trails Cafe to um, take advantage of that. Ferndale Gardens is at the bottom, and I designed an entryway that docents could meet and they, people could have tours there, as well as um, the gateway to Griffith Park, the gateways. And here, the top section is the central gardens. The middle one goes from the picnic area through the detention pond. And then the bottom one is through Ferndale Gardens, give you an idea of the topography. Here is a design for the edge and fencing along Ferndale Gardens. The, they've had a terrible problem with vandalism and people have actually stolen hundreds of these ferns that they've put in. So it has to be fenced and gated. But right now it's chain link and it looks awful and there's sandbags. And so my idea was to pay homage to the 1930s with the wrought iron, but also all of these plants and animals exist within this area. And then the central playground and botanical gardens, 
you know, in a knot of a tree is where animals live, bees live, squirrels hide their nuts. It's an area of activity. And I thought that oversized bird's nests that kids could explore and areas of playing with, with uh, tree trunks and, you know, the real nature-based play. And also, of course, the botanical garden of learning about the ecosystem that you're about to enter. So this would be chaparral. And you also, there's the riparian area. And so, of course, that would be having riparian plants. And so it's another way for people to learn about where they are. And then this is an educational opportunity that could exist within the park. That throughout the park, there would be oversized statues. And I say oversized because, you know, pack rats are like this big. So <laughs> it has to be a little bit bigger for people to find them. But I do have the pack rat, and it says, you know, this is, would be in the upper area along the oak woodlands. And pack rats oftentimes have their nests in the oak trees. And so as a brochure, it could be like, can you find a pack rat nest as you walk through? That might deter some people from wanting to use the park, but it's still <laughs> a good opportunity. So my overall goal was, of course, to protect our wilderness. And I, I think that giving people a place, a safe place, to have experience with nature without negatively impacting nature is also extremely important. It's the only way that we're going to protect our wilderness in the future. So, thank you.